Hi, everybody, and welcome uh, to, the, uh, to our latest, I consider it our grad school excellent, not our grad school fair. Um, and uh, we have a wonderful panel this evening. Uh, my name is Gideon Rose, the editor of Foreign Affairs. Uh, we wanted to showcase with so many aspiring, actual, and uh, ex-graduate uh, students around, we wanted to showcase what the ideal life of the mind uh, would be actually like if you were in an ideal grad school. And uh, the first thing I read in grad school blew my mind uh, and in many respects changed my life. It was uh, Bob Cohane's introduction to neorealism and its critics. And it basically said, you're all thinking, everybody thinks theoretically, whether they realize it or not. And if you uh, don't think you are, then you're just basically unself-aware. Uh, and if you are self-aware, then you can at least make your theorizing explicit. And what real intellectuals do is they make their assumptions and theories explicit and then compare them against other people's theories and predictions and see what the evidence actually shows and tries to live a self-aware intellectual life. And that that's what one should do with IR. And so that's why you're going to read this incredibly big chapter book on Ken Waltz's theory and so forth. It blew my mind because I had been from a classicist and a journalist and a policy wonk. And the idea that sort of truly intellectual sort of thought theoretically about things in a way that sort of got to the underlying reality and then sort of got past the sort of surface stuff to, and then debated which different models of underlying reality were uh, more accurate. Um, and that, that was a really fun thing. That was a new experience, and at its best, it was incredibly uh, uh, powerful, fun, and challenging. And too much of today's academy misses all that stuff and goes off in silly directions. But I decided that we would have some fun by doing that in the magazine, because one of the fun things you get to do when you control some real estate like this is do what you want with it if you can get other people to go along. And so we commissioned, no, not this issue. I actually had like the, uh, the May-June issue, if anybody was having. Sarah, can I get the May-June issue? It's in July, Thanks. August. What? July. July, July, July August. I can get the May-June issue. Uh, the, yeah, July, August. Um, we decided to do a theory test on how the world was, uh, what was going on in the world. It's pretty damn clear that no one knows anything about what's going on. Anybody who thought they knew is, I don't know anybody who has predicted the events of the last few years uh, accurately, one way or the other. If you do, send them to me, thank you very much, so that we can publish them in foreign affairs. Um, so the very first thing we should have all learned is humility, and that's actually cool because if you're an intellectual and you don't know things, that's an opportunity to learn, and learning is fun. Um, so. <laughs> What we did was to schedule a theory test in the magazine. And the idea was, let's spec out a whole bunch of theoretical approaches to the world we're living in and um, uh, see if we can get uh, intellectual purchase on what's happening now by going back and forward in time and connecting through paths and grand narratives, and then seeing which of these stories intellectually fits our gut sense of, this is plausible, better than the other ones, a sort of ratchet theory test in, in, in IR terms. Uh, and we had a great time putting this together, and the result was this package that we have. And we are deeply fortunate tonight for having two of the people from this package, um, Professor Dan Doidney and writer and author uh, Kevin Drum, with us to discuss not just their contributions, but the broader question of which way the world is going. I should say that uh, Amy Chua, unfortunately, couldn't be with us tonight. We really wanted her. She has a great piece in the issue. Um, she's here in spirit. Um, and I'll try to sort of uh, take some of the, the, the arguments from the other speakers as well. And with that, let me kick it over to you guys. But first, let me set it up by saying, OK, the four people in the debate, as it were, who are not here, were representing other theories. They were representing realism. OK, Steve Kotkin's piece, right? Talking heads, what it's like, same as it ever was. Okay? Same as it ever was. Big, great power competition. It's going to be China and the US. But we know this story. The idea that we were in this new world was just a fiction, an artifact of American hegemony. And as that hegemony wanes, yeah, the same old story of realist competition plays out with new changes rung in the 21st century. That's an interesting theory. OK, interesting, good expression of it, too. Um, we have uh, Josh Busby's environmental piece. This one, you know, like any environmental disaster movie you've ever seen, you know this one, right? Okay, 
we're all sitting here on the Titanic ranging deck chairs when you know the oceans are freezing. This time the iceberg isn't gonna hit us, it's actually going to be us, right? Or you know, or actually melt. The iceberg's gonna kill us by melting rather than hitting us. Okay, that's the, the, the environmental one. Uh, uh, Amy's one, the tribalism, that you know, all this stuff about identity politics, why are you so surprised by it? Identity politics is what human humanity is all about. And you know, we we used to call it tribal thinking, and there's a lot of this kind of stuff going around, and you see it in lots of kind of places, and it explains international stuff via nationalism and domestic stuff via fragmentation of identity politics, and that's really the underlying human reality that is connecting different phenomena. Um, Marxism, that was a fun one to assign and it's actually done very well because no one really talks about that. One of the great things, I remember when Michael Doyle wrote his book on ways of war and peace and there was an entire section on Marxism as well as realism and things and I was like, why are you writing about Marxism in the 1990s when you know this is an intellectual tradition, the whole thing is that and he was like, Gideon, you idiot, this is a great tradition on the left, there's a lot of interesting thought on this and it's gonna come back because there are deep underlying values and it deserves to be up there with all these kind of things and just because you like Thucydides is fine but you should also appreciate Marx as well. And he was 100% right and I've learned enough so that later on I include the Marxist stuff as well because it's a great kind of debate and um, we had a wonderful thing about, you know, Marx wasn't wrong, he was just early, right? If you wanna know if there's a great theorist out there for why the rich get, you know, why as Leonard you know, Cohen put it, the rich get richer, uh, uh, why do the poor get screwed? Because that's what the rich people do to the poor people because that's what capitalists do and that's how it works out, okay? I mean, it's an interesting theory that's getting a little more play. But we have here two proponents of two of the most radical in today's thinking uh, theories um, or positions. One, uh, arguing in whatever way he wants because any liberalism today that people are willing to talk about is such a rare little species that you know, any version of it is fine. <laughs> but any kind of optimism that this is not in fact the end of all things and life will has a positive future. So that, that's gonna be an interesting thing for, for Professor Doidney to talk about. Um, and <clears throat> Kevin Drum has made the best case that I uh, uh, have seen uh, for why all those people who are skeptical about just how significant historically the IT revolution is are kidding themselves because all you have to do is wait and everything will be changed. Um, and let me just say with that, two little words more about them before I turn it over to our panelists. The best part of grad school is the professors and the other students. Um, the other students basically, and, and the reading matter, frankly, if you get good teachers. Uh, you get to discuss interesting thinkers and ideas with smart peers in a sort of fun setting, led by people who are smart discussion leaders who have thought about these things and are smart, interesting people. We have two of those here tonight and that's why it's kind of fun. Dan Doidney is one of the great intellectuals in the IR field and he writes stuff that I don't even, you know, he's, he's so much smarter than me that I have kind of hard time sort of reading some of the early stuff and you know, not being intimidated by it. Uh, but he also can write clearly and intelligently and gracefully for a general audience and we're delighted to have him uh, enlighten us and maybe at a later point you can actually explain to us what the hell the Philadelphian system was and why it matters but we can talk about that in a separate kind of thing. Kevin Drum, I've been reading Kevin's blog for 15 years now and I have to say that aside perhaps maybe from Cass Sunstein, I don't think there has been anybody that I've read over that decade and a half who has contributed more to the principles of the enlightenment in practice than <laughs> Kevin Trump, who has been an extraordinary blogger and source, single-handed yeah. source of commentary, almost like Andrew Sullivan's uh, single magazine blog, right? Kevin has written a single blog, first-person blog, for 15 years covering every single thing in the public policy arena, mostly domestic policy, not foreign, um, with a clarity of vision and intellect and writing uh, that is uh, remarkable. And uh, his, he, he describes himself sometimes as part Vulcan and that it gives him an ability to see things without the emotional uh, perturbations that many of the rest of the commentators have. And it has been a great source of uh, intellectual insight. And uh, it's great to have him here in the foreign affairs uh, fold in person as well. So Kevin, thank you for coming all the way from California for this. With that, let me actually start, oh, let me start with Kevin and then you can rebut a little bit or take, take a look at it. Kevin, why is 
this time different. We've heard that technology will change things, that jobs will go away, that life is gonna be radically different a hell of a lot. And sometimes it seemed to have happened a lot, but in our lifetimes, the change has been less. There aren't the flying cars. There's a good argument that can be made, you know, the Peter Thiel stuff, that the big innovations have already happened and so forth, and the, the, the new tech stuff. Why are you projecting that the future is gonna be so radically different? Yeah, well, that's pretty easy. Uh, you know, the fact is, now, am I on? Can everybody hear me? Everybody on the back, can you hear everything? Somebody thinks I'm mm, cool, okay. Um, so the, the, the biggest pushback you get, why, so when, when you talk about artificial intelligence, and, and if you're like me and you say, well, it's just gonna get better and better and better, and eventually the robots are all gonna be smarter than us, and, and, and what are we gonna do? The biggest pushback you get is, yeah, yeah, that's what they said back during the Industrial Revolution, and guess what, it didn't happen. Um, the answer to that is, you said we've heard this many, many, many times. We've heard it once. We've heard it once. We've had one revolution of this nature in the, all of human history, um, and that's the Industrial Revolution. And yes, it's true. A lot of people during the Industrial Revolution did say, hey, that's going to put people out of work. And in fact, it did put people out of work in the short term, and it actually took longer for the Industrial Revolution to kind of work itself out than most people give it credit for. But yes, in the long run, everybody did get jobs and it didn't work out the way the pessimists thought. We all just got richer. Now, second time around, remember we've only got one data point so far. So it doesn't really do you much good to say that some pessimists were wrong about the Industrial Revolution. This is only the second time we've had it. Now, Industrial Revolution, what it did was give us muscle power. It moved us from animal power to mechanical power, huge thing. But you still needed brain power to run all the machines. And when we get the second IT revolution, that's all up here. And when that happens, we're gonna have both muscle power and brain power taken over by machines, and there is nothing to a human being except muscles and brains. That's it. So, when you, when, you, when you take away the need for muscle power, you've taken away half of what human beings provide in the way of labor. And that's why we all kept our jobs and got richer. When you've got something that can also beat us out in brain power, um, it's not clear to me what human beings have left that those robots aren't gonna have if they're both stronger than us and smarter than us. Okay, let me follow up for 200. Um, <laughs> it's a clever periodization, and it makes the argument nice and simple. I presume by that what you're doing, since what you're actually mapping onto history is several hundred years of history, mm -hmm. what you're basically saying is that historical record, a continuous historical record, can be usefully viewed as being divided into sort of like two parts for the further subdivision. So the first division is, the industrial era transfer of power from you know animals or mm -hmm. machines to, to machines, and then the IT transfer of brain power from people to machines. So that, and then the second thing you're saying is we're in we've experienced the first half of that IT part, but not the really good valuable part. We've used IT so far to replicate minor functions of intelligence that have helped make us do things better and have not challenged. The reason the IT revolution hasn't challenged our primacy to date is because it's only been doing the lower functions. And so what we're about to kick into now is the second half of the second story. It's the higher functions. And that's when the real transfer is going to happen. Is that basically oh, yeah, the story? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, when I write about this, I usually try to, I even try to start out by making it clear that we don't have artificial intelligence yet. We don't have anything close to artificial intelligence yet. What we have is Siri. We have Watson. Okay? I mean, they can play game shows. They can help us find a coffee shop next door, um, which is great. But it's not artificial intelligence. It's not really anywhere close to it. Um, but um, you know, again, think back to the Industrial Revolution. You know, the very first steam engine looked completely hopeless. I mean, if you go back and read about the first steam engine, which was you know used to to pull water out of mines in England. It was, it was a piece of junk. It failed constantly, it barely worked, it, it, it looked for all the world like 
it simply didn't have any value. I mean, it was not worth the trouble of using it compared to just having people go down there and bail out the water. And for actually, for many decades, it still looked the same way. And there were only some very kind of things specific to the geology of England, of northern England, that made it just barely worthwhile. And that was enough. That barely worthwhile, it got better and better. And then James Watt came along. And then finally, we got a steam engine that really did matter. And then we got electricity. And that really mattered. And that was what really, that was what really brought in the uh, Industrial Revolution, was, was electricity even more than steam. Um, in the case of artificial intelligence, I, I, you know, all you can say is the stuff that we have up till now is, is, is just toys. And useful toys, but just toys in terms of the capacity of the human brain. I mean, if you look at it, if, if you want to do it mathematically, which doesn't really make sense, but people like doing it that way. You know, the biggest computer, the biggest useful computer today has kind of the, the equivalent brain power of maybe a millionth of the human brain. I mean, it's so tiny as, as not to even matter. But um, unlike uh, steam engines, which took a, a century or more to become, to become uh, really useful, computers evolve a lot faster than steam engines do. And yes, we're now at the second, you know, it's kind of a yeast curve. It doubles, 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 and you get to kind of the knee of the curve where suddenly it kind of looks flat, and there's a middle part here where it's kind of curving up, and then all of a sudden, it looks for all the world like it goes straight up. So we're and, turning onto the hockey stick part. Right, and, and nothing has changed. I mean, it's still doubling, but it just looks different. From a human perspective, from the perspective of a human lifetime, it looks, it looks different. And, and we're still a ways away from that. But when I say a ways away, I mean, in my opinion, 20 or 30 years, we're away from that, from that hockey stick. So is this a version of the singularity? Uh, I take the fifth. <laughs> OK, fair enough. By the way, that phenomenon of the sort of constant curving motion producing a dramatic drop-off effect at the end that seems like it's a sudden thing, but in fact is not. I remember first learning that when I was studying the physics of the curve, because that's why a curveball is hard to hit, because it's actually not sort of speeding up, but it's, it's, it's the motion can be. At least that's what I was taught. Maybe that's not. And so it seems like it's <laughs> dropping off a cliff at the end, because you're seeing that last bit of the thing come down. OK, the skeptic's question to you. It seems like the world is going to hell in a handbasket, that liberalism's day is over, democracy is dying, geopolitics is returning. Even if we don't go into, if you're not beaten by the robots, it'll be the Chinese or the everybody else, whatever. So why, and liberals have been saying, this time is different, we're going to end war now, we're going to end history now. Why, why are all the liberal protestations about um, this time it's different true now when, when all those generations of liberals who were saying, now we're finally you know, in the future utopia and things like that, why were they wrong? Why, why, why are today's liberals not as wrong as their predecessors in imagining sort of future utopian fantasies? Well, I'm uh, somewhat ironically cast in this role in that uh, I think that the future um, is going to be very tumultuous, uh, but <clears throat> the past has been extremely tumultuous as well. And uh, in thinking about the application or the relevance of liberal, democratic, capitalist, constitutional uh, polities, uh, the last 25 years has really been a very unrealistic baseline. Uh, for most of, of the ex experience of Republican polities, the language we used to use to describe self-governing regimes, uh, they were very precarious. Uh, and uh, they have, over the last two and a half centuries, emerged uh, from utter obscurity, really very marginal in the scheme of things, to being the single uh, most dynamic and dominant uh, entity on the planet. Now, why has this been so successful? And part of the reason is because of its uh, tremendous adaptability. Uh, modern liberalism is uh, married from the outset uh, to the Enlightenment uh, and to the Baconian project of Promethean modernity uh, to uh, develop uh, new knowledge about nature, uh, which we will apply for purposes of technological application uh, for the purposes of uh, improving the human estate. Uh, that's been at the core of uh, the modern liberal democratic uh, worldview. And modern liberalism has done so well 
because on the one hand, it's very good at stimulating innovation, right? L look at where all these innovations have come from. They've come from societies of this sort. But then these innovations create all this disruption uh, and create all these unintended side effects. It's inherent to, to these technologies that there's all these losers, there's all these transformations. Liberal democracy has done so well because it is pragmatically oriented and is very adaptive. It's capable of dealing with these problems better than any of the rivals that we've had uh, in the modern period. So is this a version of the Churchill quote about democracy being you know, the worst form of government except for all the others? Well, th that's certainly true. Uh, it, we, no one wants to say that democracy is by any means a perfect form of government. And uh, it's, I don't like the word democracy as much as I like republic because uh, in a republic, the, a bare majority doesn't actually rule. Uh, in a republic, you have uh, circumscribed government. You have circumscribed uh, majorities. You have circumscribed everything. And this is the theme of restraint. People talk about republics. What, what is it that they are? Well, the old characterization, I think, really gets it right, which is republics are governance of, governments of restraint. And basically, <clears throat> my work, my general argument laid out in my book, Bounding Power, is essentially that as the powers given by technology change, right, power bounds, we have bows and arrows, and now we've got hydrogen bombs. We have this transformation of the material world, all of this additional empowerment. And as that empowerment occurs, you have to have a new set of restraints. You have to reconfigure the architecture of restraints. And basically, our task now in this century is to reconfigure the architecture of restraints in a way that is going to adequately preserve our fundamental values in the face of these new empowerments. Now, what is fundamentally novel about now is that the scale has gone up. This, is, this has been true throughout history, uh, that the range of these interactions was the dominant trend across time is that we can interact at distance, rising interaction capacity, rising interdependence to the point now where we have on a planetary scale, and I like the word planet rather than global, on a planetary scale, we have levels of interdependence of interaction that in the past we experienced only on much, much smaller scales. And so our task is to establish architectures of restraint that are appropriate to these empowerments now on a planetary scale. Now, this is our task. It's not inevitable that we will get this right. It's not inevitable that we will get it right the first time. But it is inevitable that if we don't do this, then we will suffer grievously. Liberalism, in this sense, it, it has been miscast as this, let's go higher and higher and higher. Liberalism, in, in the sense of architectures of restraint appropriate to the circumstance, is really an agenda for preventing downsides, to preventing disasters from occurring. It was to prevent the disaster of tyranny. It's to prevent the disaster of world war, that we have these architectures of restraint. So it's not a guarantee that we will be able to do this. It is guaranteed that if we don't do it, we're going to have very uh, troubled times. OK, I, I simply cannot resist following that with, <clears throat> for my 200 to you, to take off slightly more forward, Franklin's famous comment coming out of the convention to the woman who asked him what they had delivered was, a republic if you can keep it. Right. You just wrote about restraint and how we are a republic and that it's protecting against the, the downsides. Can we keep it? Well, that's always the question, you know, one generation to the next. Uh, and you think about uh, this technological juggernaut. We're, we're riding the tiger. You say it's the Industrial Revolution. Really, it's the Agricultural Revolution. It's been this succession of technological developments, uh, and it's cumulative. That's, that's the important point, that from one generation to the next, it's not going to recede. It's not going to go back 
barring some sort of civilizational catastrophe. But the capacity of humans to solve problems and to transmit those solutions to the next generation is, has not really gotten that much better. Uh, I like to think of this as a kind of two different curves. On the one hand, we've got this technological curve, which is going up. You know, it, it, we're, and we're doing the equivalent of advanced calculus now with regard to uh, the, uh, the material world, cyber, nuclear, et cetera. But when we look at the governance capacity, we're still down here in arithmetic, okay? Addition and subtraction, can we get up to division and multiplication? That's the, that's the challenge, and can we transmit it? So this gap, this gap is actually growing between our capacities on the one hand and the types of restraints uh, that we need because of these empowerments. Uh, so this is to say that the generation that is now uh, coming of age uh, is in some sense, like all previous generations, it's confronting a new set of threats uh, that have, in formal terms, many of the same characteristics, but the gap between what we are inheriting to them, what, what we have, and what we need is probably greater than ever. Uh, and that would be a, that would be a, a source of pessimism, uh, that we can't expect this to happen uh, quickly, easily, uh, without some uh, bumps along the way. Uh, that we learn people are not good at anticipating problems and creating solutions to them. They have to experience the problem in a, in a fairly acute way, and then they have to interpret it correctly, and then they have to be able to engage in various forms of collective action towards arrangements that are actually fitted to the circumstances. That's a tall order. That's something that we've done historically in the past, something we have to do again, but it is daunting. But that sounds to me like something that would have sounded exactly right maybe five years ago. And now it seems like even that sounds too optimistic because the world seems to be going, not just sort of pausing before going forward to the next big set of challenges to cover, but is actually heading in the wrong direction on some of these metrics. And uh, what optimism, what motivates, aside from saying we need to have liberalism because if we don't, we're all screwed, because the problems are getting worse, what is your optimism that that will, uh, what, what is your confidence that the needs will actually be filled? Well, I wouldn't want to call it confidence, uh, sort of cautiously, hopefully optimistic at best. Uh, and, you know, the 19, or 2017, you know, 16, uh, has clearly been a sort of bump along the road. Uh, you know, Brexit, Trump, and so forth. Uh, the resurgence of authoritarian regimes all over, uh, the decline in uh, global governance uh, momentum. Th th these are clearly very bad developments, uh, but I don't think that we want to uh, panic you know, fully yet. Uh, there's a kind of yeah. uh, relentless uh, pe presentism to many <laughs> of these pessimistic uh, scenarios, and there's this tendency that we all have you know, the Soviet Union ends and liberal democracy expands a bit. Let's extrapolate. It's the end of history. You know, then we have uh, a bump and we're going, oh, things are looking bad. We'll extrapolate. Disaster ahead. Realities uh, are, are, are self-correct in a variety of ways. Uh, and we also should take uh, hope from the fact that liberal democracies have dealt with much bigger problems than the ones that we have now. Uh, its survival, you know, was in many instances in the past uh, uh, very much in jeopardy. Uh, it's been a close-run thing. And this is one of the, I think, most unfortunate legacies of Francis Fukuyama's work uh, is to remove um, the, the, the sense of contingency and the sense of uh, heroic agency at junctures that were part of the uh, emergence of this world. It wasn't automatic. It wasn't some sort of seamless predetermined uh, succession. Uh, it has been uh, bumpy. It has been at times in fundamental jeopardy. But nevertheless, we have persevered and we have uh, sur surmounted these problems. You know, fascism, communism, much larger than what we... Donald Trump is an insect. I mean, these are just nothings. Yes, yes, Hungary is, Hungary is, is going, you know, doing whatever Hungary is doing, and that's a terrible thing, and maybe they'll have to get tossed out of the EU. This is zero. This is nothing compared to stuff that's happened in the past. 
it doesn't mean that liberalism is dead. I, I mean, it might, but it still doesn't, it doesn't mean that. There's just nothing going on right now in my mind. That says, Let me tell you, here's a little story. A, a couple of months ago, Gideon invited me to uh, come to New York and be on this panel. And so I got on my computer, and I bought a plane ticket. And uh, yesterday, I got on the plane, and the plane flew me to JFK. A uh, taxi took me to the hotel, and uh, then I came here. How's that for a story? <laughs> Pretty boring. This is the world. The world is not a lot different than it was five years or 10 years ago. 9-11 didn't change that much. It was a hell of a lot more important than the election of Donald Trump or Brexit. But even 9-11 wasn't that important on the grand scale of things. Okay, so why? Because the things, make it theoretical, the uh -huh. things that really matter and drive and shape things are what? Like why, if the things don't, why are these things, okay, what are the things that are not insects? What are the things that are not epiphenomena? What are the things that are not chop on the waves of history? What are the driving forces of history in your argument? Well, I mean, first of all, it's not clear to me that whatever those things are, it's not clear to me they've changed a lot, okay? okay? So, uh, uh, for example, if you were to say that terrorism is a big, a big issue and a big thing driving, driving the next century, well, uh, okay, and, you know, I'll, sure, it is, but... It's not that big. Um, now, you know, I'm taking, I'm taking the viewpoint that all of this stuff is overwhelmed by technology. Um, you were saying that uh, one of the problems is that uh, people don't react well to new technology, don't understand it quickly. And I'm going to tell you, that's just only going to get worse because there is a difference between IT technology and all the other technology before it. And that is that we are now... We're almost at this point. If we're not at this point yet, we will be in a very short number of years, which is we're building technology we don't even understand. Um, and we literally don't, I mean, we're building it out and building it out and building it out, and we literally don't know, you know, when we push the button and run the program and it tells us something, we don't know for sure how it came up with the answer and so what the, happened the, the in the black we're box. 10 years on from the collapse of Lehman Brothers, there's a decent argument to be made that that crisis was caused in part by the development of and development and deployment of financial technologies and systems whose complexity mm -hmm. had gotten out of the hands of the individuals yeah. and, and it had systemic effects that were tied together in ways that nobody expected and knew and boom, it all was there. What are the actual, what will life be like a little bit ahead in your, in your world? Like it will be for people, but how bad, how good, bad, or different will it be when well, things are going on? Uh, will these people's lives be better or worse I, 20 years from now? Um, in this room, you probably have nothing to worry about. Your lives are going to be better. Um, for a whole lot of people outside this room, um, I, the way I see it is two phases. What's going to happen is that artificial intelligence is going to get to the point where it can drive a truck, say. Okay, do, and when I say drive a truck, I mean it can do all the kinds of things that are at about the cognitive level of driving a truck. Um, those jobs, that cognitive level, um, about half the world does that stuff. Um, when, when robots get good enough that they can do that kind of thing, half the world is out of work. And don't worry about the number. Maybe it's half, maybe it's a third, maybe it's a quarter. It's a number so big it doesn't matter, right? I mean, at the, at the height of the Great Depression, what was the unemployment rate? 20%, 15%, something like that. I mean, this is, a, this is a, a, a much, much bigger number, and it's permanent, right? I mean, it will never go away. In fact, it will just get worse. As the robots get smarter and smarter, they'll take away other jobs. And eventually, yes, they will take away your jobs, but all the people in this room, eh, you'll be pretty much the last to go. Okay, but Kevin, <laughs> at, but at the same time, at the same time, those same robots uh -huh. will be producing mass amounts of great food, oh, yeah. creature comforts, all yeah. sorts of things. And so why won't this okay. be Marx's utopia in which we work for an hour or two, write some poetry, go fishing, have our lives? But why, why aren't we like some Star Trek episode where we're the gods sitting here with everything being done for oh. us while we just enjoy life? So here's How here's, bad is that? It's, it's great. Here, here's, my, here's my breakdown of it. And I, I basically see this whole thing going in two phases. Phase one is... Robots put everybody out of work. And yeah, you know, if we were smart, 
the rich people, you know, who's going to own the robots? Well, it's going to be rich people because they own everything, right? So the rich people are going to get super rich. And of course, eventually, the rich people are going to figure out, I, you know, they're not going to get richer if they don't sell stuff to people, and you can't sell stuff to robots. So I mean, they will, they will figure it out eventually. But in the meantime, what are they going to do? Are they going to just voluntarily say, oh, yes, we see what's happening, and robots are taking over, and oh, my goodness, we must take care of all the little people, and so we will therefore tax ourselves at 90% and give all the money to, to the people out there. No, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen until there's a revolution, until somebody forces them to do it. So there's a phase of multiple decades, I think, where life is bad, and life is bad because there's going to be 30, 40, 50, whatever percent of us, meaning all of us in the world, who are working to force the rich people to share the wealth of the robots that are providing all this stuff. Now, after that happens, and uh, you know, we all figure out how to, how to work this out, and, and you know, there's a lot of different ways this might work out, but when it does work out, then yes, then we've got what you're talking about. Then you've got basically kind of socially owned robots building everything, doing everything we want, and there's still a few rare things. Right, I mean, there's only just so much. Even even before the robots, you know? even at that point, I mean, like, won't we get better? Won't we get, uh, won't we get engineered meat that sure. will allow, you know, within twenty within twenty years, won't we be, uh, not have to kill animals for for sure. good meat? I mean, in fact, for example, I mean, I mean, we were talking before about climate change. Well, I, I think, in fact, that artificial intelligence is quite likely, given the state of the art of human nature right now, which is pretty dismal. We are still just sort of overclocked, hairless apes, unfortunately. I think it is quite possible that artificial intelligence is what's going to end up pulling our ass out of the fire on climate change. That just by chance, artificial intelligence is going to get smart enough to solve climate change at about the time climate change is getting ready to broil the planet. OK, now that they're blowing those ones, let me ask you one question before I turn it over to the audience to get their discussion back in. Um, <laughs> One logic for why liberalism can and should have better long-term prospects than people are currently giving it is the just demonstrably larger potential from cooperative uh, efforts and the positive sum aspect of so many of the interactions that people have, whether it's economic interactions, the potentially positive sum interaction. So in theory, there should be a lot more power to be maximized by the liberals because you can grow things, you can cooperate, you're not just forced to, you know, you're, if your alliance comes to, and team comes together voluntarily rather than through a command and control system, you can keep adding to the team, right? Our, our team has gotten bigger every decade or two, you know, over the course of the last three quarters of a century. And there's no principled reason why it couldn't, uh, you know, if we can have it. But it seems like there are always big coordination problems in the way of getting those kind of agreements. We're in Stag Hunter and some other kind of thing in which the ability of the people just to co-op, you know, the Rodney King liberalism, like why can't we all just get along and reap the benefits of our cooperation, never seems to actually emerge because people end up sort of chasing their own little short-term unenlightened self-interest and screwing the collective goods that could be gotten by cooperation. What, what makes, if humanity hasn't changed, what makes you think that in the future the, the positive benefits of cooperation will trump the human potential to fuck it up by you know, going after their own private, small, short-term goods? Well, there's no guarantee, but uh, we're Pardon essentially me. getting a situation where uh, fundamental interests uh, in security, uh, in the habitability of the planet, uh, and prosperity from the standpoint of the regulation of the international uh, economic system require that we have various forms of cooperation. And this is simply because the level of interdependence has risen so much. I, I like to say that people who are globalist liberals uh, are former nationalists and, and realists uh, who've been mugged by reality. Uh, this is not an argument about the, the, the good and the, and the appeal of the good uh, pulls us together to do good collective things. It's instead that the pressures of interdependence are creating uh, interests that necessitate various forms of integration for purposes of mutual restraint. 
Uh, I want to go back to this point here also, if I might, uh, about the, the robots and the AI and so forth. It, we should note that the question of whether we can actually build an artifact that is the equivalent of a human being, an artificial general intelligence, I think is the term, uh, is still uh, a question mark. Uh, we, we have a great deal of debate about that. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not inevitably the case that that will happen uh, ever or certainly soon. We just have to acknowledge that. Second, with regard to this uh, distribution problem, this has been the problem since the beginning, right? Ever since the beginning of the agricultural revolution, we settled down and we started having all this additional food, and, and some people could make pots and some people could make metal and so on. So we, we, the, the pie gets bigger, right, in important ways. But then this question of the distribution uh, immediately arises. And people say, oh, this is a Marxist concern. No, no, this is not Marx. You know, the, the question of the haves versus the have-nots, the question of how the pie gets distributed, this is central to political thought generally. This is central to Aristotle. It's central to Machiavelli. It's central to Madison. It's central to Weber. So it's, it's ridiculous, I think, that we continuously use this language of Marxist theory. Th this is something which is integral to all societies. And insofar as liberal democracy has had an appeal, it has, over time, come up with better ways to distribute the pie for more people. Uh, social democracy, New Deal uh, liberalism. We're going to have to do that again. And so I look at the distribution problem and say, we're going to move towards something along the lines that you suggest. And people use this language of FALC, uh, an acronym, Fully Automated Luxury Communism. That basically, we're going to have all these machines that are going to make all this stuff. And therefore, we'll have to have some distribution mechanism to make sure that everyone uh, will get some. Because if people don't, uh, in, uh, enjoy part of the fruits of this transformation, they'll become rebellious uh, and uh, they'll operate, you know, through our limited political systems to make those changes. And so the logic playing this out, the logic is because we live in a liberal republic or something or approaching it for now, the uh, pressures from below from segments of society that feel like they're not getting a real fair deal, will find ways of expressing themselves in the political system. The political system will respond in order to achieve some form of minimal domestic harmony and or international harmony. Eventually, the functional pressures of the need to cooperate to keep things from on, on track will be so great that eventually we will find a way to absorb and deal with the challenges and make things work because nobody wants to kill the goose laying the golden eggs and if the goose is about to die, we'll find a way to distribute the gold so that everybody sort of goes. Is that some version of that basically? Yes. Right? Okay, I, I basically buy that, um, it'll, I, I agree that way too. No one else seems to feel that way, so I'm yeah, glad. So do I, that's exactly, I know, but that's, it's, that's yeah. exactly my story. Which is, by the way, where I was almost certainly wrong. <laughs> and so therefore, uh, uh, this is a perfect time at which to throw the discussion open uh, to uh, uh, our, our panelists and audience here. We already have a few. Uh, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna uh, call on you, wait for the microphone to come, uh, stand, state your name, uh, ask a short question and make a comment, and we'll go forward. And we'll start right here. You first, yes. Hold on one second, we'll get a mic. Hi, this is Lorenzo, and thank you for such a great discussion. Uh, it's too bad Amy wasn't here, because actually I really liked her perspective on sort of the tribal idea. And uh, that's because I actually uh, agree with all of you in terms of you know liberalism, and hopefully if liberalism worked, this is what's happened. But sort of, I've grown maybe more pessimistic because I've seen so much backsliding sort of all over the world. And uh, the way I see it, to try and make it short, is that at the end of the day, there's seven billion people on the planet. And, you know, I don't think there's that many of them that live sort of in Western, quote unquote, uh, enlightened sort of societies. So uh, the problem I have with liberalism today is sort of its claim, its pretension to universalism. So I guess my rebuttal to that would be, uh, I think of Algeria, say, that was dominated by the French for 300 years. And, you know, they gave an offer that whoever accepted French family law would have a right to French citizenship. But the vast majority of the people didn't do that, even if that had massive benefits. So what persuades you that, you know, the rest of the world will eventually sort of, you know, jump on the bandwagon. Because it seems to me that uh, as US hegemony fades, uh, countries seem to go back to their traditional way of 
I don't know, operating, say, you know, you can go China or, you know, Turkey or whatever, you know, why are they going to become like us? And otherwise, if they don't, what do we do? Thank you very much. Uh, well, I don't think they're going to become like us in the sense that there's going to be a convergence to, you know, uh, the world as America writ large. Uh, I, I also would certainly agree uh, that the identity problem, both now uh, and for liberalism generally, uh, has been an enduring uh, difficulty. Uh, that the nation has a continued appeal, and uh, indeed, in the case of the United States, you know, there's a, sort of a puzzle: how did the United States remain so liberal and democratic in terms of its identity for so long? And part of the explanation for that is a kind of historical sequential story, which is that American national identity was forged uh, over a period when the adversaries of the United States were illiberal in some way or another. And therefore, the national mobilization in the United States, national identity formation in contrast to and against uh, those who threaten from the outside was always, we are the free. We are, uh, you know, the, the liberal democratic and they are the anti-free monarchy in the 19th century, authoritarian, communism, fascism. And so what's novel really about the last 25 years or so is we are not threatened uh, by an anti-liberal uh, external threat that we can use to mobilize an internal uh, liberal national. That's because now the call is coming from inside the House. That's right, uh, which it would tend to do. Uh, and of course, we have to also acknowledge that the United States, uh, we're sitting here in New York, you know, in, in, in Yankee land in the heart of the Union, uh, there has been this persistent divide in American history uh, between the North and the South, really. It goes back to that uh, and this great original sin of racism and um, slavery. And, uh, you know, we now have 40% of the people, something like that. Maybe it's really only 35 that fully agree with them that like Donald Trump. And people would say, oh, my goodness, you know, Americans have become so illiberal. That's not really a change at all. Okay, uh, Barry Goldwater, you know, got 41%, you know. Uh, there's been this persistent, uh, in, in terms of Lewis Hart and the, um, Hart's and the American creed, uh, there's been an anti-American creed, America, uh, that is centered in the South. Uh, and, you know, a, a particular combination of electoral developments led to this particular outcome, but it's always been here. Uh, and so what does this mean? Well, my view is that we have to have a more uh, robust and positive notion of civic identity formation. Uh, and this is why I like the language of republicanism as opposed to the language of liberalism. Liberalism suggests a kind of laissez-faire, that people will have their preferences and they'll come into the system and express. Republicanism says, no, no, there's a plasticity to identity, and in order to have a <coughs> republic, you have to have uh, inculcation mechanisms. You have to actually generate the identity uh, appropriate to the regime via the educational system. And so I think we need more civic education, civic organizations like the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, and also various forms of national and public service. Uh, in the past, we had this outside threat that enabled us to have this type of identity. Now we're going to start losing that, I fear, unless we make a conscious effort to actually uh, internally uh, reproduce it. Now, to the larger world, that why does liberalism hold an appeal? Uh, it still does. Uh, in many parts of the world, people say, oh, Putin, neo-authoritarianism. Look at all these people that are in the streets. Younger generations all over the world are still very attracted to the basic uh, package of individual freedoms that are associated uh, with now the West, uh, and that remains an enormously potent force. Uh, the people that vote uh, in, bulk, in bulk for the uh, authoritarian and nationalist tend to be older. Uh, and so uh, I'm very hopeful in you know, looking at the demographics. And finally, the, the, the crucial liberal uh, identity uh, formation is tolerance, right? We go back to the early modern period and uh, tolerance began to emerge. Liberalism began to emerge. Why? Not because people agreed, but because the costs of disagreement that became violent were so great. And so instead, the liberals said, the proto-liberals said, 
look, you think the ma Jesus is this, and we think Jesus is that. We can kill each other for another 30 years. Let's instead bracket this difference, and you do your thing, and we'll do our thing, and we'll have a public space that will be dominated by an ethos of toleration. It's, in a sense, unnatural, given the tribal tendencies that humanity has, but given the fact that there are so many of us that we are increasingly diverse and that we are increasingly interactive, toleration becomes vital for the preservation and pursuit of all the other goals that we have. And so the liberal value of toleration is something that is becoming more relevant in the world rather than less. It's so beautiful to hear that. By the way, can I just say, that used to be sort of what we all thought, or a lot of us thought, and it, hearing it now, even in these dark times, it makes you think, gee, maybe that is actually the way things yeah, might well, actually work again. We have to, well, we again. Have to keep saying it. It doesn't, I know. doesn't happen unless we I know, but that's a very old-fashioned thing. That, that was not, that was a totally commonplace thing to say or that's think right. or believe back when I was growing up. And right. It's a shame that it's saying that it sounds weird now. Yes, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, second row here first. No, no, after him, there's like a million guys. Yes, you. One second, you get In the hat. In the hat. And then they're in front after that. Uh, yeah, my name is Kevin Shanley. I'm the, uh, from the Asian Society Policy Institute. And naturally, I'm sort of in inclined toward Asia. And recently, Kurt Campbell and Ellie Ratner wrote a book in your journal there. And the subtitle was China Defied American Expectations. And without getting into the big spiel, they essentially implied very strongly that American policy towards China over the last 40 years since Mr. Nixon has largely been a failure because we overestimated our ability to shape and mold China's domestic and its foreign policy. And on the authoritarian issue, um, certainly China scholars have noticed that in terms of a Western style democracy with Xi Jinping, China appears to be going in just the opposite direction. So I'd just like to comment on that. Okay, so it's actually, a, it's a great question. I love that piece. By the way, uh, that piece we think of as part of a series of, as I said before, anybody who feels like they know, that, anybody who hasn't challenged their assumptions in the last few years is not a compost mentis adult intellectual person uh, because nothing has played out exactly. Uh, and the attempt to basically say, okay, let's take a look at the assumptions that have guided American policy in a whole bunch of areas uh, and review them and subject them to real scrutiny uh, was a thing. And so the, the, the Eli's and Kurt's piece was in that thing, like, okay, let's take a look at all you China things. Here's what we've been doing, and it's all wrong. And there was a nice follow-on debate about all the, no, 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 that's not true. It's good. There's going to be a lot more things like that. And what I would say is, okay, my question simply to you guys, let's just, then a long answer, because we have a short one, I got questions in. What, where do you think China, what do you think China will look like 30 years from now? Old. Simple question. What? Old. Old. No, I, you know, there's, no, there, there's an important point here. In fact, I was, a, I was, it was one I wanted to make to your last, to, to what you said to the last question, which is, if you look at liberalism, the mistake we made with China was a lot of people thought that, uh, that China domestically would have to become more of a liberal democracy. And obviously that, that hasn't happened. But you do notice that internationally, in terms of its, in terms of its international affairs, China is, acts as much as a liberal democratic country as the United States does. I mean, it's, it's, it's if anything, a very conservative force because, you know, it's, I mean, that's the way, you know, big hegemons tend to be conservative because, hey, they're in charge. But it, it is... It is not a liberal democracy internally, but in terms of global relations, it effectively is. And I think that's part of the question earlier, which was, why do you think liberal democracy is, is, is going to keep happening? And I think on a global level, I think Francis Fukuyama pretty much called it. I mean, every place essentially accepts it in their relations with their neighbors. It's only internally that it hasn't. So, uh, well, uh, in effect, what we really want is China to be a responsible stakeholder, and what is happening inside the black box is less relevant to us, in some sense, if we can yeah. keep that. OK. Uh, China in 30 years, what does it look like? Um, it will be old. It also will be uh, 
the coastal areas will be swamped. Um, and uh, I think that it will be in either poorer than it is now, uh, or it will be uh, reformed with regard to its politics. Uh, the, the ultimate reason why China will move away uh, from a single party dictatorship of this group that calls itself the Communist Party, which is kind of a joke now, of course, right? You know, the, the, the group, the Congress, they, they come together every couple of years, rubber stamp. The, the net wealth of, of that body uh, ranges into the hundreds of billions of dollars now, okay? It's a, it, it's a red aristocracy. It's, it's a red plutocracy of some sort. And uh, the, the, the pressures uh, for redistribution that exist anywhere uh, will be uh, present there. You know, they used to say in the Soviet Union, Brezhnev uh, brought his mother, you know, to uh, the Kremlin and showed her this great apartment and then showed her all these fancy cars and then this DACA. And, and she looked at him and said, this is great, but what's going to happen when the Bolsheviks come? <laughs> And so, you know, the, the communist regime has got this built-in kind of ideological subversion of itself in its, its current uh, incarnations. Uh, on, in terms of China and the world, uh, I wouldn't say that China is now operating like a liberal democracy. They are largely a status quo power. Uh, and the co contrast shouldn't be with the ideal behavior, but rather with what they were back in Mao's time. Remember, they were, at least at a rhetorical level, they were radically revisionist, right? They wanted to spread revolution and overthrow governments all over the world. They're not behaving like that. So what they've done is they've moved towards uh, a, the behavior pattern of, of what could be called a standard Westphalian state. They're committed to uh, the status quo largely with regard to the current distribution of rights and responsibilities, uh, and they accept uh, a lot of these rights and responsibilities. Uh, and uh, this, this also points to a problem, and John Eikenberry and I make this point in our piece, uh, that we talk about liberal internationalism uh, a bit too indiscriminately, uh, because there are a lot of these international arrangements that are part of the international order don't have anything particularly liberal or democratic uh, about them. Uh, and so we, we should think about uh, Westphalian internationalism uh, that has over time been modernized, Westphalian internationalism one, Westphalian internationalism two. And the crucial feature of Westphalian internationalism is that it doesn't require domestic regime convergence. We don't have to all be the same domestic regime type. And this is something that much uh, ha has been done uh, think about uh, the period of the Cold War. Uh, you know, our narrative of liberal internationalism is that it's this Western thing and then became global after the end of the Cold War. But during the Cold War, we and the Soviets were building a lot of important international institutions despite our great differences at the level of regime type. Uh, arms control, international health, uh, governance of the global commons, all one has to do to engage in successful Westphalian uh, cooperation and internationalism is be attentive to the requirements of interdependence, problems that you can't solve on your own that drive you to cooperation with other states, and second, be a competent state, be, be, be capable of actually implementing the agreements within your territory. That's a much wider range of states than liberal democracies. And so there's a lot of potential for, for Westphalian internationalism to continue to solve global problems and build global institutions regardless of the domestic liberal democratic or anti-liberal democratic regime type. You, you know, we almost got too good at it. Um, you know, if the only way to join the liberal international order were to become domestically a liberal democracy, you'd have a lot of incentive to do that. But this Westphalian uh, uh, system that you talk about has been so successful and so good, you, that incentive has been taken away. You can actually be any kind of and internal. I, don't think I actually don't think they're mutually exclusive because they could be a staged process. I mean, we, oh, sure. we, I always like, like look at, think of war for Korean, you know, regime change. We fought the Korean War. We got the regime change 50 years later. Uh, 
and it was all fine. You know, in, in some ways, you could start with the, the Westphalian system that you're talking about could evolve. It is, is consistent with the domestic evolution in a liberal direction of the countries within it. Exactly. That's a separate The Westphalian question. system, as it gets stabilized, creates possibilities. Exactly. And think about, you know, uh, Hungary today, they're backsliding. Oh, my, how can NATO survive? Well, NATO had Turkey, Turkey Greece, Turkey. Spain, Portugal. They were military dictatorships for many decades. And within the matrix of NATO and then the nascent European Union, they liberalized, they democratized. So actually, on, in that, on that exact point, uh, I had Celeste Wallander write a piece on, on this question of democracy in NATO today. Because it's one thing to say, yeah, we had the colonels and we had the this and the that in the 60s and 70s. There were colonels every place in the 60s and 70s. They ain't colonels every place now, and to have Turkey or Greece slip into true authoritarianism, whether you could still have NATO tolerance, that's an interesting question. Anyway, interesting. But we have a lot of questions. Let's, let's keep it short. Yes, over here. Thank you. Um, is this, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, my name is uh, Harun Mtiaz, and I'm a graduate student at the NYU School of Professional Studies, and I'm studying global affairs, and this is my first semester there. Um, I'm personally, uh, obsessed with foreign affairs. I'm like an addict, so I, I figured I had to be here. Um, and I read all these articles, and I was very struck by all of them. Um, and I'm, I wish we had all the panelists. Uh, but there was one in particular I, I had, uh, I guess you could say, a comment about. Uh, and it was uh, Dr. Uh, Duedney, is that? It's Dudney. Dudney? Dudney. OK. Um, it, it's pronounced many ways. OK. Uh, well, our, our esteemed doctor in the middle, uh, he, he made a, uh, you, you made a, make a very compelling case that the liberal international order will endure uh, despite all the, the hardships. Um, for seven decades, it survived. Um, so it, it, it does, in a sense, make sense to say that Trump, his allies, the administration, this is basically kind of like a glitch in the trajectory of American history. And so it's not really much to worry about. Um, I think that was a very compelling argument. And, and you do state that the liberal international, the liberal order has, I guess, uh, caused problems between the haves and the have, not, have nots. And you, you argue for social democratic change in the United States. And, and you, you call for reform there. And I was pleased with that side. But I really saw little to no mention in your article about reforming, the United States reforming its commitment to our values abroad. It's so much like you prefer the status quo of how the United States has been engaging abroad, when in reality, it's the status quo of how the United States has been engaging abroad, which has caused so much of the rebellion and, and the resentment in many parts of the world. And so I think it's, it's not really a, a good prescription to argue that we should just maintain the status quo with regard to our international behavior. I think that's a good comment, and I would actually say that let's leave that as a comment and get more questions okay. in. Sure. Okay, I think that's a, a, absolutely a great comment, and I'm delighted you made it. Um, uh, let's. I have promised these guys in the front that I would do them as well, but I'll go to it. So yes, you could, but get them in quick, and you and the one behind you too. We'll get two. We'll bundle together. Th too. Thank you. I'll be. I'll be brief. Uh, hi, my name's Agustina. I'm an entrepreneur, um, political science background. Uh, I want to take it uh, back a bit to some of the earlier conversations. We were talking about assumptions, and I recognize the forum is um, particularly focused on foreign affairs, but uh, the position that I take is that discussions of foreign affairs become somewhat moot if the republic doesn't survive, especially because uh, the United States is at the helm of the liberal order. Um, so my question for, for the panel uh, would be effectively, um, you know, I tend to view the American Republic as uh, a wonderful uh, entrepreneurial venture started by these great philosophers back in the 1700s. Uh, and they had some assumptions about what could work and how that policy would actually function in practice. Um, taking stock of a few hundred years of history and where we are today, and considering everything that's happening with Trump, um, what do you think are some of the most important assumptions made by the Founding Fathers that they may have gotten wrong? 
and why is that important? And the, uh, behind. Ken Wasserman, for Kevin, to what extent do you anticipate that AI can do ethics better than humans? And how does that impact your worldview? Okay, considering how badly humans do ethics, I, I don't think that's going to be the biggest, <laughs> the biggest question with AI. Um, but um, will there be anything like the laws of robotics, like Asimov's, you know, programming things to make sure that they don't harm humans? Um, that's no. a great goal. What's that? Oh, that's I. It's a great goal. Well, sure, it's a great goal, but I doubt it. I mean, I mean, one thing to keep in mind is that there's not one global, you know, James Bond organization that's working on AI. Everybody's working on it. There's going to be a thousand different kinds of it. And doesn't that scare the crap out of you? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, because I mean, there's, there's you know, you, you talk about, uh, you know, people talk about regulating it. Oh, forget it. I mean, maybe you could regulate it in the United States, maybe. I don't even think you could, but who cares? The Chinese are going to have it, the Russians are going to have it, the Brazilians the are going to have stuff, it. By the way, which is, that, yeah. you know, I was like trying to figure out, okay, so why is this not going to proliferate everywhere with everybody doing everything yeah, with no regulation? And the answer is, it is. Sure. And that's going to be an interesting point. Uh, but let's go back to the question about the, the, the Constitution. We have a structure that's actually very fixed. I had a discussion once with a foreign friend, and I was saying, oh, it's so difficult to be in a country where you can't change anything. And I think I was talking about the Electoral College. And the friend said, um, let me tell you, as somebody from a country who's had a lot of changes in government, <laughs> you are so fucking lucky for being in a country in which everything is fixed and the basic rules of the game are not up for grabs every 20 years or whatever. So shut up and take your stodgy electoral college as the price you pay for living in a nice ordered system and take all your you know, 17th century thing and worship it or whatever. What, what, what are you, in terms of, even if they did get things wrong, are we just stuck with the system and should accept it, or is there ever any possibility to change anything about American democracy on a structural level? Uh, yeah, we can change it. We have changed it. You know, how many amendments have there been? Uh, it's an arduous process, and it was intentionally designed to be, because you don't want to be able to change the fundamental rules without something approaching a supermajority support. That's the basic logic. But we'll never actually get that again, well, right? Well, we've had it. We've done it in the past, and we've had periods in American history that have been very divisive. Uh, you know, part of our sense of, of, oh, what's happening to us now is that our historical baseline for thinking about American politics might be very unrealistic uh, from the Cold War era. And even the Cold War era, we had the Vietnam War. That was extremely divisive. We had the Civil Rights Movement. That was extremely divisive. McCarthyism and so forth. But you go back to uh, before the Great War, before the Second World War and the Cold War in combination, uh, American politics was often extremely partisan. And of course, the worst period was the 1850s that then culminated you know, in the Great War. Uh, and so uh, we have an historical baseline that, that is, from our limited historical memory, isn't realistic. It's been very conflictual. Despite this, we have amended the Constitution at various points. Uh, we got rid of slavery. Uh, we uh, enfranchised women. Uh, and there's no reason to think that in the future, as problems arise, we won't be able to do it again. That is a wonderfully optimistic note on which to end. Let me thank our panelists. Let me thank all of you. Thank you very much. The, the true answer is we don't actually know any of this stuff, which is why we have a magazine and a forum devoted to thinking it all through together and sharing our fruits and having the ongoing discussion. So thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of the graduate school fair. Thank you. Great job, that was fun. Almost second.